The people of ancient Greece were the first to write down rational explanations of nature not given in terms of deities. This was a major stepping stone in the history of our civilization. For example, before that time, we would explain an annual river rise in terms of water and flood gods. But after that time, we would explain the rising rivers in terms of the melting snows of nearby mountains. This rational thinking has enabled us to develop more useful machines than would have been possible if we instead explained things in terms of gods. For example, a radio might never have been devised if its operation was to be deduced through interactions among inductor, capacitor, and wave gods. The nature deities would no longer suffice to explain the world. For example, the geometry of squares has no analogy in myth and indicates that the old deities are somehow lacking. Pythagoras did not explain the properties of triangles in terms of the personalities of deities. In the 6th century BC town of Miletus, the three philosophers Anaximander, Anaximenes, and Thales ushered in a new way of thinking about nature. For them, nature was the object of a detached and systematic investigation free of deities. It began to be believed that the world would be accessible to human intelligence. Before this time, our mythological beginnings explain how today's world came into being, but after this time it was turned around such that the intelligible world of the present provided an explanation of our beginnings. The origin and operation of nature became an explicitly posed problem in which rational and non-mysterious answers would be sought. Knowledge was desacralized. This was an intellectual revolution. Its light of reason could never be forgotten and will continue to guide the progress of the human mind. This new way of thinking bounced around the planet from one person to another and has continued to be improved upon through the centuries. The people of ancient Greece built upon the mathematics and technology of the previous peoples of the world and contributed much to our civilization. They improved the alphabetic writing system of the earlier peoples and put it into the form used today. They developed formal logic. They debated the nature of being and knowing. They asked, what is reality and how can we prove that something is or is not real? Is a number a real object? Is an ideal real? Is a horse real or does it just represent the idea of hoarseness? Does mathematics exist on its own or do we invent it? How can we distinguish between the natural and the supernatural? Until the last few centuries, the distinction was uncertain. They also made many technological advances, including labor-saving machines that multiplied the work that one person could do. Their writings about ethics came to the same conclusions as has each of today's major religions. The Greek classics exhibit the virtues of humans. Their moral principles have justice, sanctity, and truth. At the same time that the literature of other ancient states mainly discussed gods and rulers, Greek literature contained many heroes who were not gods but were people who overcame challenging situations. The Greek comedies made fun of everyone, even the wealthy citizen who had financed the play's production. Aristotle's so-called peripatetic school was an outdoor classroom along this colonnaded thinking path. The philosophers of ancient Greece thought deeply about what can and cannot be known about nature, but they did not make measurements or perform experiments. Aristotle gave rational explanations of many phenomena, but nobody got around to testing these explanations until 1200 years later. For example, he expected that ash would float on water because it was figured to consist of more fire than earth, and he incorrectly expected that heavier objects would fall faster than light ones, but nobody tried it to find out if they were correctly predicting nature. 
During the Renaissance and Enlightenment of the 15th through 18th centuries AD, we found the value of testing explanations by making repeatable measurements. The resulting scientific method has been improving the accuracy of our explanations ever since. Half the male citizens of ancient Athens were literate at a time when literacy rates were more commonly 1% anywhere else in the world. The democratic Athenians openly debated ideas the unique, literate, open, and democratic aspects of ancient Athenian society may have had a lot to do with their being the first in many intellectual pursuits. In contrast to the many times and places of the world in which our kings and queens and conventions produce centuries-long environments of overly constrained lives and unfree thought. The Hellenistic culture of ancient Greece greatly influenced the Western world for hundreds of years. We all know of Zeus, Hercules, Plato, Aristotle, philosophy, ethics, and democracy. Our most important buildings still follow the architecture of classical Greek and its Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian styles. Bands of gatherer hunters often make decisions by forming a consensus among family heads, but there are as many reasons for political systems as there are groups of people. The people of each region of the world have chosen their own system in response to their own history, culture, circumstances, and preferences. Two particularly important early viewpoints have been voiced by the ancient Israelite distress of kings and queens and the classical Athenian distrust of power concentrated in the hands of those few persons who own most everything in town. In classical Athens, democracy meant that the people held power in common and that there was equality under the law for both rich and poor. Democracy was meant to protect the people from the random laws of a small, economically privileged portion of society and serve the interest of all citizens not just the privileged. Through the decades, classical Athens contained 25,000 to 40,000 adult males. About 40% of them were defined to be citizens because they held a minimal amount of assets and so were allowed to vote and to hold office. Females could not. For comparison, just before England's Great Reform Act of 1867, only 40% of the adult males in England had been allowed to vote. Though only males were allowed to be citizens, every male citizen in Athens was allowed to give his view during official public meetings. Women were not allowed to take part. Athenian democracy originated in response to the growing oppression of city residents by the rich few. The first step towards citizen shared power was taken in the year 594 BC by the leader Solon. He complained that the unrighteous privileged leaders could not restrain their excesses and grew rich by stealing for themselves. Solon warned that the widespread economic exploitation, discontent, corruption, and indifference of the powerful was in danger of causing civil strife or even tyranny. He said that he wanted to restrain and correct this unjust situation. A royal palace system had begun to develop in Mycenaean Greece around 2000 BC. This royal system was similar to those of the many city-states throughout the Mediterranean and Middle East. The Mycenaean palace system was destroyed about 1200 BC when the Dorian people migrated into Greece. This was followed by a political dark age lasting for several centuries in which there were no kings and queens. The dramatic change then occurred in Greece as part of society became involved in overseas trade with the older Middle Eastern states. This portion of the people began to accumulate and display a great wealth and luxury that was furiously denounced by the people of Athens. The people said those who have the most today want twice as much tomorrow and that wealth makes one mad, has no object but itself, and is insatiable. At the root of wealth is a corrupted disposition, a perverse will. Wealth would bring injustice, oppression, and disorder by enslaving the masses. The people represented civic values as opposed to rich extravagance. 
Their new democratic wisdom would bring moderation, proportion, fair limits, the golden mean, and nothing in the extreme. You may have heard of the ancient Greek tyrants. A tyrant was a town boss who could have his way because he owned much of the town. Foreign trade had brought excessive wealth and social and economic injustice, and in response, the assembly of equal citizens was created. The citizens were equal in that law now applied equally to all. Each citizen could take part in the assembly, and each person's vote counted equally. Each person could also take any other person to court. In several ways, democracy in ancient Athens was more extensive than today's version. For one thing, the daily operations of the city, down to the smallest detail, were discussed in public meetings or assemblies. The entire voting public would meet to decide whether or not to construct a building and who would be paid to do the construction or whether or not to send a cargo ship to a certain port. They would also decide whether their city would go to war with another city. When the citizens voted for war, they knew that they themselves would be the soldiers who would fight and die. Each citizen was allowed to stand and speak during assembly meetings. While talking, the speaker stood on this platform and faced his fellow citizens and the Acropolis. Each speaker was expected to express his views in a short and to-the-point message. Each man could speak only once per issue and would be ridiculed if he talked too long or strayed from the issue. The leading citizens were those whose advice regularly proved to be good. These men were often expected to speak so that other citizens would know and follow their advised course of action. A person was allowed to speak for only a few minutes, as timed by letting water drain from this upper pot into the lower one. An experienced speaker would talk to the last drop. After this public debate, decisions were obtained by counting votes cast by a show of hands. The citizens met in an assembly to vote on the issues of the week. There were about 40 assembly meetings per year. The nearly weekly issues were pre-selected by a council of 500 citizens, each of whom were selected by lot to serve for one year. Names were placed in the slots of this board, and then one name was randomly selected. The city of Athens was divided into ten districts, and to better guarantee a cross-section of people throughout the city, the Council of 500 consisted of 50 persons from each of these ten regions. Before each meeting, the Council posted the current issues for all to see and discuss. Literacy and public debate were essential. Any citizen could propose a new law or action, but if it were shown to be inconsistent with previous laws, he would lose his citizenship rights for a few years. Citizens were paid a small fee to attend the assembly meeting so that it would be attended by all, not by just those wealthy enough to have free time. How are new laws proposed, debated, and approved in your nation today? Democracy in ancient Athens was also more extensive than today's version in that individual involvement occurred as citizens took turns holding various offices. There were no elected officials in ancient Athens. Instead, governmental positions, such as those of the councillors, were filled by random drawings. The selected person served for about a year, and no person could serve twice in their lifetime. Where the knowledge of professionals was needed, there would be permanent positions, but most governmental positions were temporary. Many Athenians felt that the benefits of a more experienced politician and official would be spoiled by a growth in corruption. Today we sometimes find that long-term positions for career politicians leads to aspirations of power and selfish actions. Today's democracy consists of elections of professional, lifelong politicians who are hired to make our daily decisions for us. Since we have the technology today to make decisions by a show of hands through the internet, for example, it seems to be a safe bet that a change will be coming to today's more limited form of democracy. 
trials were also decided by the vote of the citizens. Murder trials were held outdoors on the top of this hill so that it was readily seen by all. Before the time of democracy, if one didn't have wealth and influence, it was hard to get access to justice. It was also hard to get justice from wealthy persons because they were conducting the court. Athenian democracy placed the administration of the courts into the hands of the citizens. There were no paid politicians, there were no paid professional judges, and there were no paid district attorneys. The judge and jury were amateurs. The jury were judges of facts and law, and they determined verdicts and penalties. The number of jurymen depended on the severity of the charges. Every 60-year-old citizen was required to be available to serve as a court arbitrator. He was an ordinary person, but had considerable experience of life. At any time, there were several of these arbitrators. Each case was assigned by lot to one of those arbitrators. Anyone could bring a court charge against any other person. Do you feel today that you could take court action against any person or corporation, which is an organization of persons that have done you wrong? A convicted defendant would be fined, lose his civic rights or property, or even his life. The accuser was rewarded if his case was won. However, the accusers would have to pay a fee if they failed to get at least 20% of the jury to agree that the defendant was guilty. Each year, about 3% of citizens were serving in the government. Through any 25-year period, one quarter to one-third of the citizens had served in their government. And each year, 15 to 20% of Athenian citizens were registered to serve in the courts. Today's parliament and assembly members consist of a much smaller portion of the population, and each member tries to serve permanently. It is also true that the members are not a cross-section of the people of a nation. Do you think people today would like to be randomly selected and paid to serve a one-year term in an assembly? More so than it does today, Athenian democracy meant self-government, individual involvement, participation, and random representation in the daily decision-making process. There was everywhere an ingrained suspicion of the corruptive effects of power. Their system was inefficient in time and labor, unprofessional, cumbersome, uncoordinated, and plagued by annual discontinuity. But ever since have the citizens held full control over their daily operation of their own city and government. The people of Athens had total control over the legislative, executive, and judicial portions of their government because the people of Athens were the government. The citizens felt that they were in charge of their own affairs. There was no feeling of us versus them, as occurs in some of today's representational governments of career politicians. The Athenians knew that only 30 miles away, government was very different. Athenians could also vote to expel or ostracize a citizen from town for 10 years. Voting to expel a person was done by writing names on broken pieces of pottery, the so-called ostraka. The Athenian society was open and tolerant of public expression, criticism, and dissent. They wanted democracy because it protected them from the random laws of a small privileged section of society. Still today, these are the characteristics of a people choosing democracy as their form of government. Legal decisions were no longer made by the upper class who were operating to safeguard their own interest. The people simply wanted freedom and its power along with political equality and freedom from exploitation and injustice. Since we innately react against any interaction that is not mutually beneficial to its participants, we can all sympathize with the desire of the Athenians to protect themselves from the injustice of being overrun by the seekers of wealth and power. The richest persons of Athens had to pay special taxes for the privilege of being wealthy. They might have to pay the annual expenses of a naval vessel 
or the cost of a musical presentation or theatrical play, and they might even have been the object of its ridicule. The Athenians later modified this such that the 1,250 richest persons paid for these items in proportion to their wealth. In his book, The Athenian Constitution, Aristotle described the following essential features of full democracy. If all citizens are to be equal, then the people must be sovereign. The will of the people is determined by a majority vote in a popular assembly open to all citizens, regardless of wealth or rank. There should be no governing class. Instead, all citizens should take turns holding office. The officers of the state should be appointed randomly, except where it is clear that some expertise is needed. There should be no property qualifications for office, and tenure should be short and infrequent. The citizens should be paid for attending the assembly and for serving as jurors in the court. As an argument against professional politicians, Aristotle said that the combined knowledge of many novices exceeded the knowledge of one experienced person. Which of Aristotle's features of democracy are part of your nation's democracy today? One group of 30 wealthy persons did manage to take control of Athens for a seven-year period. They wanted to put an end to the egalitarian society so that they could control the wealth of Athens for their own benefit. They managed to do this by pretending that many extreme measures were necessary because of a war that was occurring at that time. For example, instead of all citizens attending the assembly, they temporarily restricted its access to just the wealthiest persons who were then free to act in their own interest. The man Alcibiades of Samos was privy to the real motives of this group and exposed them. Athenian democracy then lasted until Alexander the Great's Macedonians put an end to it by conquering the region. The Athenians enjoyed their full democracy for just a few centuries and then had to wait many more centuries before democracy would return. Today Greece is a vibrant, thriving democracy. Citizens are knowledgeable and participate in public debate, for example, through protests for every necessary reason. In most of our modern democracies, we elect lawmakers from a group of professional politicians. These elected officials take care of the day-to-day -day business of running the city or state. In Switzerland today, there are regions which are called cantons and have assemblies in which citizens meet to decide local issues by a show of hands. Do you think that you would like to be involved in every decision of your local community's government, or would you rather spend your time elsewhere and just leave these things up to elected officials? Can you control every elected official? Will excesses occur if you do not monitor your elected officials? For example, can they take the nation to war on their own whims without needing permission from the general population? If they can, then the people are not in control of the members of their own government. The Athenian government was a form of democracy that was different from modern forms. If you would like for your city to be totally governed or, or operated by the people in the same way as occurred in ancient Athens, all you have to do is raise the issue in your hometown and find out if others agree.